This discussion is called Breakthrough Strategies in the Zoom Era. And in case you don't know me, uh, because I don't think I have seen uh, Trevor before, but my, my name is Jim and I am the instructional designer here. And we will get to know each other in just one second, um, I'm sure, because there's going to be some moments for us to all uh, talk together. And this is a small enough group that that should be able to be done pretty effectively. So before I begin, though, I would please like to do a land acknowledgement. So we are gathered here this evening, and we teach on and with the homelands of the Yakima Nation. And I would like to acknowledge and thank this community, their elders, both past and present, and future generations. In addition, I would also like, before we begin, to just set some ground rules for participation. So during this, particip during this presentation, there will be plenty of chances to speak. But please, if you don't mind, if you could stay muted when you're not talking. So I think I can hear one microphone on in my uh, headphones. So if you don't mind muting yourself, and if you need to stop me while I'm speaking, could, if you could please use the raise hand function in the chat, in, in our chat window, it bumps your picture up to the top and, it, and, I, and I see that you're trying to speak. Um, otherwise, if you have a uh, kind of bigger picture items to say, uh, please put them in the chat box. But I, and it says here that I'll check it periodically, but as it turned out today earlier, I did not monitor the chat box at all. I was very unsuccessful with that. So we may just have to bring those issues up verbally. But first to, to get started, this talk is premised on the 2016 um, book by uh, our very own Dr. Kathleen Ross called Breakthrough Strategies. And she told me the story of how it was created. Um, and it was very interesting. I was telling my SIL 805 students about it too, but she took a sort of unorthodox methodology. She, uh, in order to gather data, the preliminary data for this, she recruited students to stand in the quad and stop passersby as they were going from one class to another and ask them to name, to identify professors that they thought were particularly impactful and what those professors were doing that was so successful. And then she contacted them and was able to flesh out these ideas into, she originally wanted to do some note cards, but that idea blossomed into a series of videos. We'll watch some clips. And, um, and then in turn, in 2016, it got published into this, into this book, Breakthrough Strategies. And the, the main thrust of this book is that it it imparts best practices for gauging new majority students. And when we hear the video, um, the, hear the video clips, we'll, we will hear the term first generation students, but the book employs the term new majority students to um, incorporate members of other categories too, such as people who maybe come from low income or immigrant families. So we know that we are serving a lot of new majority students, and this book was produced in our own, uh, you know, in our backyard. So this is, this is us in a way. So this really, really hits close to home. And it covers various areas of teaching and learning, four to be specific, uh, student engagement, how to promote a sense of belonging among students so that they feel like they're um, uh, really part of a community of learners, how to engender confidence in students, and also how to, how to help guide students towards seeing themselves and visions of their futures. Um, and as the subtitle of the, um, the book suggests, it is classroom-based practices to support new majority college students. And although this book was produced only four years ago, it was written in a time where we never could have imagined 2020. 
and how starkly different our learning context is now than than it was even just one year ago. Uh, so I thought it might be a good opportunity for us to take another look at these strategies, or at least a, a, a sliver of the strategies uh, offered in this book in, in our in in our context. And it, uh, you know, I am not a I'm not in the classroom myself right now, so you might think that some of this feedback is uh, a little uh, general or or maybe off. And I want you to think about those moments, and hopefully, you will be able to um, uh, help me fill in the gaps and kind of uh, make this uh, even even stronger moving ahead. Uh, and I see that Stephen has his. Uh, Hand raised, Steve. Would you like to stop me there? I just wish you would uh, tell me what a new majority college student is. Yeah. So generally, um, the the term that was used in the past was first generation students. So um, those are students who are the, the 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 first people in their family to be attending college. Um, but we also want to uh, include in this sense, in this category, we also want to include many of our students come from immigrant households. So those are students that are included in the new majority. Low income students are students that are um, in the new majority. And whether that refers to like the new majority of college students in the world, I don't know. But I do know that it, um, uh, it refers to probably the majority of our students. Would anyone else like to speak to what a new majority student is? I think you did a good job, Jim, on saying what the new majority students are. I think that even though it might not be the 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 ones that are in power, um, but it is, but there are more, um, you know, they're not, you know, there, there are more, there's, there's a lot of Hispanics in, in our, in our, in our nation even, you know, and so, and we know that that's growing and growing and growing and growing. And so um, maybe that's, and then just different groups of people coming in. So I, I think you did a great job explain what it was. And I would also note I would also note that while this book may be aimed at these students, at this sector of our student population, these strategies are pedagogically sound. And I think they apply to teaching in general. And I think you will find that too as as we um, as we progress through it. So I want to look at three of these strategies. And the ones that I want to look at today are how we can engage our students with effective feedback, how we can support students' critical thinking by getting them to ask questions, and, and ways that we can relate to students' personal life situations, which seems to be especially uh, crucial in, in, in our current context. So how this will work is um, I'll present a little piece of context that I, that I think probably applies to today. And then I'll go back and look at the strategy in Dr. Ross's book. And then we'll try to apply it to, um, to this Zoom era that we're living in now. So first is the effective feedback. And the scenario that I paint here starts with the idea of student retention. And that we've noticed that um, a lot of students have been sort of falling off the radar and um, uh, kind of um, uh, they're, they're sort of disappearing this semester. And we know also that of the students that are staying, sometimes engagement has been inconsistent or um, students maybe seem less motivated. And in some instances, that means that their work is suffering as a result. Well, one, one essential piece of learning is feedback. And so I think that's why um, 
the uh, feedback is is uh, is is a centerpiece in in um, Dr. Ross's book, and what she proposes is a uh, is that the that feedback is worth talking about in this context with our students because it is prone to stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is when someone enters a setting where they know that some people in that setting may have a negative stereotype regarding one or more facets of their identity. And the problem with that, walking into a setting where, well, there, there are many problems with stereotype threat, but one is that it makes you interpret feedback perhaps differently than it is intended. So not all feedback, feedback is not a one size fits all scenario and students don't respond consistently to all feedback. So the example in the book is when you start with encouragement um, or you say, you know, good try or next time you can do a better job. That can be perceived by some students as being patronizing or demonstrating that you don't think they can do better than they already did. And as a result, they may not be motivated to try harder or to really take your feedback into account. So um, Dr. Ross, along with our very own uh, Mary James, who has just come on the line to watch herself for the second time today, and I know that's exactly how she wanted to spend her evening, <laughs> but we're going to um, watch the breakthrough strategy that is, um, that, that is a four-part strategy for delivering feedback that is effective for new majority students and beyond. Oops, I am pretty sure that I did not optimize for computer sharing. So let me try one more time here, and here we go. My breakthrough strategy is a four-step process for giving feedback to first-generation students. On the first day of class, I make a sincere but firm statement that I have very high performance standards and that I do not lower them to accommodate any students. Step two is an equally sincere statement that I am convinced that every student in the class can meet the high standards. If I'm meeting with an individual student, I always repeat this affirmation. My visualizing the students succeeding allows them to visualize their success as well. Only after clearly explaining these two points is the third step taken, namely describing topic by topic the ways in which the student's work needs improvement. In written comments or feedback sessions, I always elaborate with positive concrete examples of their work that meets the standards for the class before outlining the areas for growth. For instance, I will commend the quality of the examples included before explaining how the student needs to reorganize the order of the ideas presented. The fourth step in the process is agreeing with each student on a specific day and time when he or she will submit the revised work. I also mention that if the student doesn't meet the deadline or call to reschedule, that I will call them or email or text and I always get a phone number. Believe me, this strategy works. Mary, I didn't offer you the opportunity to before, but um, you know, this, this was filmed about seven years ago. Would you say this practice has held up over time or have, has anything been changed since then? Or would you have anything else to say to speak to this? Um. I actually think in our Zoom era, the strategy works equally well. And to some extent, there's less, there's less distractions. Even when you're sitting side by side, if you're in a room with other people and such, there's less distractions. Um, I try to do this also in writing. Um, I, always try to name the concrete 
successes. And I start a new paragraph before I say, and here are the growth areas, um, because I want students to actually take in that success and own that success and, and feel good about it uh, before we say, okay, let's, let's look at some things we can do to grow. So. Mary, why do you think it's important to begin feedback by saying, I use high standards in this course? I fear, I fear many students have been ignored, um, have not, have not had the um, attention to the, to show, to show what they can do. And um, I think I think I might be a little softer in the way I deliver about high standards now than seven years ago, but I do, I still emphasize this is difficult material, uh, but we're a team here and move forward that way. So uh, I'm not turning on my screen right now because my uh, lighting solution for the daytime is a disaster at night. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> and I look as if I'm coming from beyond. Right well, now. you know what? I think that's a good opportunity then for me to reshare my screen very quickly here and move on to how we could recontextualize engaging feedback in the Zoom. So I think it is um, important as the fourth piece, the fourth component of that feedback strategy is to set up individual times to meet with students. But that can be kind of a nightmare logistically if you try to do that on Zoom. So my suggestion to you is to use your personal room on Zoom in order to have feedback conferences with students. So in that way, you are giving all students the same link and you, um, when the students uh, arrive at their scheduled time, you get them in the room and then you enable your waiting room so you can allow other students to, you know, line up in the hallway, as it were. Um, and I'm not sure if everyone on the, on Zoom, on, on our, uh, meeting right now knows exactly what I mean when I say that. So I think maybe really quickly when we're in Zoom, in, in, in my account, in our meetings, I have a list here of all the meetings that I've already set up. So I teach SILT 805 and I have the faculty help desk. So I have those meetings already scheduled, but I also have this personal room that I can open any time. And so what I do is I just give this short link to my students and then I come into Zoom and start my personal meeting. And then students all have that same uh, URL. So, uh, so that's one piece of feedback that, or one one uh, suggestion that I have if we're trying to manage these these feedback sessions. Also, when you have them put students in the driver's seat, Mary referred to it as tutors not touching the pen. So in that, so what I mean by that is students should be doing as much as possible during these feedback sessions, have them screen share, have them pull up the assignment description, have them retrieve your feedback so you can make sure that they know how to get to your feedback. And then together, you guys can co-construct a, um, a plan of action, how you are going to attack the improvements and the growth to be made, as well as setting a timeline. Uh, I also suggest using our, our technological tools to deliver feedback through multiple modes. Um, Mary just referred to the fact that she writes some feedback in prose, so she'll in paragraph form, um, but she at the same time also conducts live sessions where she is speaking one-on-one -on -one with students. So 
being able to vary the ways in which you are reaching students with your feedback is, uh, um, is advantageous, uh, especially because for me, um, sometimes I don't know the tone of, of written feedback that I get. So if someone is especially terse in just their written feedback, like in the margins or, or in the comments on the side, then I don't know if they're angry or if it was a frustrating experience for them to read my work. Whereas if I get a recording where I can hear them talking me through the feedback, then I get a little, it feels a little more personalized and it feels like I can kind of read the, the tone and I can read um, the vibe a little bit better, if you will. Um, I also like the idea of providing feedback sessions that could be for individuals as well as for groups, because sometimes students feel intimidated coming to you one on one. And so it would be awesome if they could um, get feedback, uh, depending on the circumstance with with someone else in the class with a peer that they feel uh, comfortable with. And also, when we have students that are strictly asynchronous sometimes the relationships that we build with them are based only on writing so it's great in those situations if you can produce some kind of live feedback so record a video of yourself um, talking them through your feedback so that they can feel like they're being taught by a real person and not by my heritage i guess we might say also create opportunities for peer feedback. I'm sure many of you in your practice already uh, use Zoom breakout rooms so that um, uh, students can get together for group work. But if you create a structure in place, and Ed really made me think about this from our earlier um, session today, that when we do peer feedback, it has to have a structure or a guide so we know what students should be looking for in each other's work and how best to approach that. But if we have those parameters in place, then the Zoom breakout rooms can be really great for um, students leaving feedback, as well as with the discussion forums in MyHeritage for asynchronous students. But there too, sometimes, um, when it says post, uh, you know, create an original post and reply to two other students, the first thing that we get, and sometimes the only thing we get is, this was so good, good job. So students really need to learn how to do, um, you know, to, to give substantive feedback. And then finally, um, if possible, to be as flexible as you can when scheduling these sessions, both for synchronous and for asynchronous students. So it doesn't take much for you to set up your Zoom room. It's not like you're driving to campus and, and getting into your office. So if possible, um, to sort of um, be able to accommodate students and students busy personal lives whenever possible. At this point, I would like to turn it over to you. And I was wondering, I see some participants have already raised their hands here. Um, uh, Gloria, do you have something to say at this point? Did somebody else have their hand up too? Uh, Steve did, but I think it's because I didn't lower it from before. Oh, okay. I was gonna ask you, um, so I was thinking because I have so many classes to grade and, um, and so, so I have a lot of papers and lots of assignments and things like that. And I was just thinking, do you have like, okay, so I do know that I can do, uh, I'm just thinking I'm gonna start doing more um, feedback audio, uh, just kind of giving like, just talking like you were saying, uh, do you, what be what would be your suggestion around certain, certain, tools or certain things to use. I know we can use Panopto and that's just visual. Um, but when we're using, um, when we do audio or audible type feedback to students, what would be um, an idea that you have that we could use? With I, I think the best tool, oh, and using it on my, through MyHeritage, is that what you're Yeah, saying? like I'd love to be able to um, like, I wonder if, if there's a way that we could put our feedback on the homework section. Do you know if there is? I know we could do like, is there, 
is there a way that we could do it like right in there, right in the grading part and we can like talk instead of write? We might need to look into permissions for that, but in that'd be really cool. Feedback, Mary, correct me if I'm wrong, please. But in my heritage, when we leave feedback on assignments, there is a way to attach files, isn't there? Yes, there is, and you know, I'm, uh, we could. Uh, I don't know what our time parameters are. We could, we could have um, somebody just do a quick share, and we could go and look at the box but you can you can upload files so i would assume that we might be able to make those be audio files because i always upload a rubric and i upload upload the the commented on artifact the student gave so but i've never tried to do audio it's and like new ground for me so I, th I think that is definitely something worth looking into. So Gloria, I'll check that, okay? But let's, let's assume that that does work, that that's okay. Here's what I would suggest doing. Um, the, the free program uh, that I use is called, oh, is called Audacity. And it's a really simple recorder that just uses your computer's mic. Um, and so you just simply use the, the record stop. And what I would do here is I would record a, a session for my students' feedback. And then in the file, I would export it as an MP3. So then you would just create a folder possibly on your, on your um, hard drive that has, uh, you know, various MP3s that you saved from students, from students' feedback sessions. Um, yeah. Uh, what does anybody else, what, does anybody else have anything to say on this front? Okay. I definitely agree with um, with that. I think given students um, multiple opportunities to gain feedback and multiple um, environments to get it is definitely good. I think one of the challenges that we have in um, the Zoom setting is the number of students and being able to um, give them feedback. Let's say if you're teaching two or three different classes to give them all feedback in a, a, a reasonable time um, might be a little more challenging for the professor than, than not. Um, Any strategies for dealing with that, the number of students that, that you have found particularly successful in that? And so what I've done in terms of, so I do a lot of, um, because I want to give them multiple opportunities before they turn in the final assignment. So I do a lot of peer reviews, a lot of uh, uh, discussions, and um, and then sometimes I come about and give them, uh, even in the, in the individual session, I do 10 or 15 minute session and say, hey, let's meet, let's, um, let's talk about uh, your intra paragraphs. Um, and I um, kind of give them feedback from that. That's great. So that, in a sense, limits the scope of your feedback so that it becomes more manageable to deliver. Is that, in a, in a sense, what that is sort of doing? Yeah, and it makes... Um, so the first time I met with my students, I did 10-minute blogs. Uh, and there, you had to learn to be a little more precise in your feedback because you know you have... 10 minutes and you're going to meet with 25 students and you have this amount of time. So you have to be kind of, okay, let's talk. Let's see what's your challenge. Let's see, how can I help you? Uh, so it, it causes you to be more of an expert in giving feedback really quickly and um, more precisely to help the students. I like it. That's, that's really great. And you know, if you have that many students and you're trying to give them feedback on their intro paragraph or their writing and they have multiple drafts, one thing that I might suggest that's been helpful for me 
when I've been a writing instructor has been to adopt a minimal marking code so that you kind of develop these conventions for feedback that you get, tend to give over and over again. And you kind of set up this code of, um, you know, I will say, I will write frag if you have an incomplete sentence. Um, and so that it can kind of save you time in the moment to deliver feedback. But 10 minutes, who 10 minutes with 25 students all lined up, ready to go, that you all are like marathon runter, runners. And Mary does hour long ones. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't get it. It's so, um, it's just, I'll never forget that. For the rest of my career, I'll never forget it. It's hour long. It's amazing. It's so amazing. All of you guys, it's, it's really great. Well, if we don't have anything else to say on the feedback front, I do have two more strategies. I have about 25 minutes and two more strategies to look at, and then we can definitely come back to feedback as well. So, um, Let's pick up where we left off. The second strategy is about, oh, excuse me here real quick, is about asking questions, getting students to ask questions. And so the, the small piece of context that I have is that sometimes it can be really difficult to get students to speak up in these in in, in these Zoom sessions. And because of that, it can be hard for us to gauge what they're understanding, what we need to spend more time on, strategies, teaching strategies that are working, those that are not, those, those ways that we have of keeping our finger on the pulse of what's happening uh, from on, on a day-to-day -day basis um, become trickier on Zoom. And getting students to ask questions is a really important part of that because it, um, is it's part of critical thinking. As Dr. Ross says in the book, thoughtful question asking is a vital aspect of activating real student engagement. But it's equally important for you as the instructor because students' questions provide additional insight into curricula, into your curricula. Um, things that you may not have even thought of before. Um, so, so curriculum planning could be potentially informed by students' questions. And they also serve as a really important means of formative assessment for, so, you know, sort of seeing what students are, are um, uh, what they're missing and what they're seeing as, as you go along. So the breakthrough strategy here is uh, given, a, I have a little bit, oh, Steve, please go ahead. Uh, I, uh, on the audacity uh, you know, uh, memos, I was uh, looking at my cell phone. You know, I have a place on there where there are voice memos. And I was wondering if it's possible to do something using that to make a voice memo, save it someplace, and then send it in and attach it to as a file is that that's possible? an absolutely that's a totally viable option and if you want to do that because because i think that's a great great easy you're just using your mobile device um i can help you i can help you do that um you know no, at, during a help session it. or something i, I don't great. use it but yeah. it's there and i just was wondering if it saves on the phone someplace where i could attach it to a file and, and then get it and put it where i you know, on to uh, attach it to the feedback thing on assignments. That's exactly what you have to do. You're just going to, it's going to create a file on your phone and you'll put that file onto, yeah. um, get, get that on my heritage. So okay, yeah, well, exactly. Just, exactly. I, I will um, experiment with that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here we go with um, back to question asking. And here is um, our breakthrough strategy. My breakthrough strategy includes several approaches to help students overcome the fear of asking questions. First, I psychologically reposition myself from being the one giving the students the knowledge to the one acting as a personal guide to help them understand the subject. I tell them I don't give grades. I'm here to help you do your best in my class. I acknowledge that doing your best requires a lot of effort. My job as their guide 
is to match the effort they're willing to put out into achieving the success in this subject. That gives students a sense of permission to ask questions and get the help that they need. I have to remind my students that there are no dumb questions. And I add that someone in the room probably has the same question as you. And that person may be shyer than you. So if you don't ask the question, then they're not going to learn either. First generation students usually come from families where responsibility to family and community is very strong. So making them feel responsible for the learning of others can help overcome their fear of asking questions. I also use a lot of humor and a light touch. <laughs> Laughing relaxes my students so they are intellectually ripe and open to critical thinking. It helps them to relate to me as a real person. Another approach I use is the think, pair, share format. First, they listen to a thought-provoking question that I present. I give them time to think about it, and then each student shares their thoughts and questions with another student. I then call on random class members, asking what they came up with in their sharing. I give them the option to report their partner's questions if they don't want to share their own. And this helps overcome a fear of putting them on the spot, having to ask their own questions. I often give my students high praise for good questions. If they ask a question that I don't know the answer to, I'll give them the opportunity to answer the question for five extra credit points. This motivates students to come up with some really insightful questions. One thing that was um, interesting to me there is uh, something that that came up in my SILT 805 class tonight that, that Linda um, talked about, which was the idea of if you have a question about this, then other people in the room probably do too. And I've heard that before. That's not anything new. Um, but I always thought of it as a way to make people not feel dumb about asking questions. But the way that he said it, it's like instilling this idea that we're all responsible for each other's learning. That just seemed so powerful to me this time. You know, I've, I've seen this a couple times now, and that was just one thing that really stood out to me there. I mean, getting students to ask questions I is break. absolutely critical. And so I think in terms of managing question asking on Zoom, I think um, it's important to create a structure for asking questions. So um, just like how I did at the beginning of this, I created a very simple protocol, stay muted, raise your hand if you want to interrupt me, um, put things in the chat box and that so that everyone knows what the expectations are and it's simple and fast and make sure to build into their times for students to participate in times for them to ask questions. Um, everybody's favorite topic is wait time. It's really important that we don't feel so awkward during these long pauses and ways to do that are potentially to turn it into a joke. Um, earlier this uh, semester, Sarah Augustine gave a, um, uh, a talk and, and just sort of said, I'm good at waiting, folks. So I, you know, I can wait all day long for you. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do anything until somebody responds. Uh, it also might be a good idea to create a think time before a response time. And guidelines are to give that anywhere between 20 seconds and two minutes before even asking for the responses. So that would be a silence that would inherently not feel awkward because the whole idea is that it is supposed to be silent because students are just formulating what they will ask. And that might help limit the actual wait time that you have to do when getting trying to get students to volunteer. But in general, if you can wait 12 to 15 seconds, which seems like an eternity, it gives students an opportunity to um, to participate before you uh, go on or before you um, have to resort to calling on somebody. Also, 
you should try to allow students to ask questions both written and verbal because not all students are comfortable voicing things aloud but they would be completely fine asking questions in the chat box so be a little bit better about monitoring your chat box than i'm being right now um and and really during those if you create this structure during these question asking moments really um tap into the students who are asking written questions as well it's also good practice to to hold on to students questions and to be able to use them in the future so that it helps create this sort of continuity between these separate distinct zoom classes that you have every week it um, helps tie them together if you can say remember last week when so and so said this um, so questions can be a great opportunity to do that and as you are uh, encouraging students to ask questions it's important to be culturally responsive and remember that not all backgrounds, um, students don't all come from backgrounds in which they're supposed to ask questions in the classroom. In some contexts, students are just meant to answer the questions or, or meant to, um, you know, to take notes and, and, and be more receivers of the information than really trying to critically think about it. And so as we transition our students into, into, in, into independent learners, into critical thinkers, we have to, um, we have to help guide them. And, and learning to ask questions can be a good opportunity for that. At this point, I'd like to turn it back over to you. Do you have any, um, strategies that are working for you in terms of either getting students to ask questions in order to um, you know spur participation among your students is anything working particularly well linda i i just find it really useful um to set that tone on the first day that i meet them and to I use the word facilitate. You know, I like the word guide also, but I, I'm there to facilitate their learning. Um, I usually make a joke and say, you know, I'll do, I'll do anything. I'll bend over backwards to help you learn the material that you need to know. Um, the only two things I won't do is I don't go to class for you and I don't do your homework. <laughs> so, you know, the rest, you know, if you have issues, if you have personal things going on, if you need some help, if you need to talk to me privately, I'm here. I'm, I'm willing and able to help you. Um, and my classroom is a safe classroom. And, you know, we set up some guidelines for sharing and, you know, what should stay in the classroom and what doesn't go beyond and, and helping everybody to feel safe. Um, and, and if you create a safe environment, they will ask more questions. Um, and sometimes even just helping them. I mean, we help them in the nursing program. We talk about, you know, what, what's your best way of studying? What, you know, how do you best learn? Um, is your environment set up so that you can learn? And what could we do to help you set up that environment? Um, I talked to you before in our class about, I, I will be teaching all day. So I'm gonna have students for six to seven hours a day. I'm gonna to have to create, I've already got bunches of ideas. I'm also a psych nurse. So I've got several ideas for, if I give them a 15, 20 minute break, five minutes of that is gonna be doing something that gets their head away from what we're doing. So they can go outside and walk around their house. They can go hug their child or their dog or <laughs> something that's going to get them away from thinking about class, um, those kinds of things. But that's what I see our role as facilitators is helping them when they're so stressed out that they can't think of what it is they could do because they have so many things to do. So you have to give them permission to take care of themselves. Thank you. Anything else, you guys? Was the question to, were you asking what we did to facilitate questions, getting students to ask questions in the classroom, Jim? Sure, can you speak to that? 
So one of the things that Ed talked about this morning that we are doing in University 101, which is new for us, um, is um, when the students, they have a group activity where they are required to come up with five to 10 questions um, per, for this discussion. So we're, we do different units. We're doing, we, we're finishing up, well, I finished environmental justice. And so we did environmental justice. And so there's a group, every, every, all, we have five different groups and they all are divided into groups. And they, um, they, their group has to come to class and lead the class with questions. And um, so it's made them think. It's really, really pushed them to think. And it really causes the other students to engage because like Ed was saying, on that day, we are just sitting back and listening and just letting the students talk. Sometimes I am, but I am just kind of pushing them a little bit. Like, hey, say something in the chat box if you don't want to say anything out loud, you know. Um, and they do, and and so it's it's that's been like a really really cool thing, um, getting them to um, engage like that. Wouldn't you say, Mary? Or wait, I I don't want to ask you, Mary, because I don't know if that's worked really good in your class. Never mind, don't answer. Steve, do you have something to say? Oh, and Mary, did you, do you have something to say? I, I actually am getting plenty out of coming to this session twice because I am going to start all the classes now when we're having discussion, telling the students that they can write in the chat box. And if they don't want to read it, I will read it. So I'm going to see if that helps. Uh, I have some high school students and I have some pretty um, shy uh, first semester students. So I'm getting a lot out of this too. Yeah. Steve. No? Oh, let me lower your hand. Okay, well, you guys, I, I um, just- this is, this is George. Uh, one of the things that I ask my students to do is to come to the meetings that I have with them with questions. You know, um, most of the time I already giving them feedback on a design prototype or something, you know, that they submitted their layer on. So I always ask them before I meet with them to come with questions from me to help me provide the best guidance for them or point them in the right direction. So they always come prepared, you know, to that meeting with questions that they have for me. And then we can talk about it during the meetings and hopefully come up with a path forward. So that seems to work pretty well. Great. So one of the things that I do, uh, there's a couple of things that I do. It's one like the parking lot where it's like in the chat box or um, to make it more anonymous where students feel a little more safer. I use either um, a Google Docs that does not have any names or even um, it's called um, Holy V, which is kind of like a, a um, you get to put it on your phone or your computer and you can use it and you see, and you can share your screen and the uh, uh, responses are automatic and it populates it. So it's some of the, this, the smaller things that I do where students don't feel intimidated if they have a question that, you know, they don't want, should I ask or should I not ask that? And they feel a little more comfortable in uh, uh, asking questions. Um, and so, and Glory is asking if you might be able to share a, or at least write the name of that that program in the chat box so we can see it. Polly, oh yeah, Polly. Um, um, that's very cool. And at, in the meantime, I have about eight minutes, and I did have just one more strategy, so I'm hoping I can get to that. I'll, and I'll go quickly, but um, let me just share my screen one more time to um, do that. I hope that didn't. Um, mess up the chat box there, but I have finally relating to students' personal life situations. Uh, and the context is with this whole black box phenomenon where, where we thought we were going to be seeing students' faces like the Brady Bunch, but it really just turns out it, it sort of just looks like an empty room. We don't know exactly where students are connecting from. Um, 
anecdotally, I've heard that um, some students have been have been joining Zoom sessions in their car because that is the 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 quietest place for them to be. So this goes back to the strategy from the um, book of relating to students' life situations and really and really um, respecting the fact that students may have issues of space and place, that their home environments might have many distractions, that there could be people in every room and it may be difficult to carve out a space that you can um, have that is you know, quiet and um, sort of secluded. Um, and also in addition to that, we have busy work schedules and busy personal lives and things have just been made that much more complicated by the pandemic. So, um, so there's a whole lot going on that we can, and I, I personally believe that we should relate to in our students' personal lives. So here's the strategy that we had from this one. My breakthrough strategy involves adapting my thinking to these home circumstances of first-gen commuter students and helping students identify solutions to these challenges. So I begin on day one by having students write a short autobiography, including their current challenges. When I read these, it usually becomes evident which students will have a difficult time studying at home. I try to get to know these students better by devoting a little more time to connecting with them before or after class and on campus. When I share the syllabus with the class, I point out that each assignment requires at least two and a half to four hours of study. This helps the students visualize the amount of time they will have to devote to this course. I also share a map of campus with the students the first day of class, pointing out the resources that are available, like tutors, the financial aid office, the library, etc. And also and I think that is, in the interest of time, that's about where I'm going to leave it on that um, clip. And to add to these ideas of relating to students' lives, I also included, um, the, I'm just going to put these all up here and we can just uh, open this up for discussion. But um, the idea of, if you can, creating stopping points along the way dur during your learning experiences so that students might be able to attend to, to interruptions that come up. That might be one solution to help some students who have a lot going on at home while they're trying to be in class. Um, also, the idea has been coming up several times this semester of um, whether we should in force a video on policy or if we should just allow the black box phenomenon to occur. And it seems like in general, there is support for the idea of respecting students' privacy and letting them not uh, have their video on except maybe in certain circumstances like testing. And and in doing that, a uh, recommendation that I would have is to to find other ways to make sure that students are in the room, that not that they're just the black box is on and they're doing something else. Um, so to heighten the verbal engagement that you have or to uh, make use of students' reactions, making sure students are, you know, giving a thumbs up when you ask them to or uh, just doing other little checks to make sure that everyone is engaged and is, is staying with you. Um, also, if possible, I suggest just giving high flex options for students. Attendance is kind of an idea that is in flux right now because of everything that's going on. So if there are options that you can have for students who might have late work or students who may not be able to show up for your Zoom sessions, it's really invaluable for them. What goes hand in hand with that is the idea of recognizing students' stress. They have a lot going on right now and and as I said before, things are a lot more complicated now with COVID-19. So if we can try to help meet students where they are, um, that can be uh, really, really valuable for them. And at this point, I'm wondering if you have anything else to share about um, this strategy relating to students' personal lives or, or, um, or any others. I would just like to open it up to you all. I can just confirm 
that I have seen two or three students join, turned on their videos and they are in their cars. I have also seen students who are passengers in moving cars. Luckily, they're not driving the car. Uh, so uh, uh, frequently, because I have a six o'clock class, students are just getting home and they'll join from their phone and they'll say, I'm on my way, I'm, all, I'm in the driveway. So yes, yeah, students, uh, if we make them comfortable being honest about where, uh, where they are and that it's no shame to be um, that diligent and that committed. <laughs> I have a student who is at work during our class and she only makes it for half of the, half an hour of that class. And I don't even know if she's really getting it. It's doing her lunchtime, <laughs> but she's trying to be there and she is engaged. She's participating. She's starting to, to participate in some of the other assignments, but um, learning to walk through that during this time and to partner with the, the student during this time is quite a challenge. Um, yeah, it's quite a challenge. What have you done um, to accommodate her for making up for the rest of the work that she misses? Like what's your strategy for that? Well, I'm recording everything so she can go back and look. Um, and I posted in a couple of places, but I posted on the on our week, on the week of our class, and um, we have conversation about her just going. I, I give her extra time, like if she doesn't get, if she doesn't get it done, I'll like, oh, did you remember? Um, make sure, like if it's turned in late, you know, I still give her partial credit, and um, and and when I say late, I mean like. Three weeks late, not just a couple of days. I'm still giving her credit three weeks later, you know, because um, <laughs> I want her to pass. I know that. She, oh, I I think that she could get. I think she's she's smart and she could grasp the material. She's just uh, she just got to work, and so she's trying to go to school and work. And it's it's hard though for the 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 instructor as well. But um, I'd be interested to hear what other people might do. In a case like that, if you had a student that was working and coming to class one day a week, the class is twice, coming one day a week for half an hour. Actually, one of my one of my students uh, calls him from work too. Um, so what I've been doing is um, having him do most of the assignments during the weekend and get it to me. That way it gives me time to review it so that the time that... Um, I have said with him when he's calling from work is just to discuss the assignment and the progress and what, uh, you know, make sure that um, I'm pointing him in the right direction, you know. And in fact, he even took talking to his supervisor to allow him that half an hour that we schedule in order to get that work done, you know. So he's using most, most of his time during the weekend, you know, to come up with uh, what I need from him. And then we have the scheduled half an hour to talk about progress and expectations. That's a good idea. Thank you, George. S setting the time aside to meet with the student, right? Once a week? Once a week. Jiminy Cricket. Once a week. I, I like that. That's a good one, George. Thanks. I have a student who's uh, getting close to having a baby. <laughs> I think we're having it together <laughs> because we've made all kinds of accommodations uh, to make sure that she's safe and well and everything. But, but I, congratulations! I also... <laughs> congratulations, Steve! <laughs> it's very exciting, actually. But. Uh, <laughs> I have Many recorded my sessions and I've had students character. miss and I always get in touch with them and say, well, you're lucky because we've recorded it and you can go there and um, look at the lecture video. But I, I've started checking now to see who's actually doing it. And, and I, it's a little disappointing because the people who are missing the class aren't doing it. And have one really good student and she's the only one that's, that is actually 
looking at the lecture videos. So how do you get the students to, to, to go to the lecture video and actually look at the classes that they've missed? And I, I think that is a really excellent question. And it is actually after eight o'clock now. So if you have to leave, I completely understand. You can completely dip out. But um, otherwise, if you do um, have any feedback for getting, you know, I, I noticed too, I'm an asynchronous student for a program for a class called Feldenkrais, which is about, it's, it's about your body. And so there's these Zoom sessions that I'm supposed to record. And I just or that I'm supposed to watch some recordings. And it's so hard to motivate myself to watch something after the fact for some reason. So what are some strategies for that, for getting those asynchronous students to really watch them? So Jim, you're in the cringe at this one. <laughs> I what was that, Mary? I shorter uh, video yeah. of what's going to be covered because sometimes recording the class is long it's really long and we have some pauses and or you know how to edit them i bet uh, I actually sure jim it. showed me how to edit and i did go back and shorten all my uh videos um and also wanted to see that what they were seeing because when you're talking you can't really tell but there were some complaints about the Wi-Fi not working very well, so I could see what problems they were having, and that that was interesting. Um, yeah, that that is that's very interesting. That so, Mary, you basically record a recap, right? Uh, I try to keep it under twenty minutes. You know, it'd be ideal if it was more like twelve. But um, um, and you're right, Steve. I watch them after I record them just in case. <sighs> you, That's you a lot record of time. You do it in Panopto? You do it in Panopto, yes? Actually, I do it in Zoom and then do the okay. convert in, okay. uh, in Panopto and the, uh, because I, I know how to do all of the embed stuff that Jim and Ed and different ones taught us uh, from doing it the Zoom way. So, um, that's, that's the way I have been doing it. I really like that, though. That really helps students. It's kind of like, you know, in, in the past, it would be like, if you're not there, um, your partner will take notes for you. Hey, Mary, I wonder if it would be interesting sometime to see if you could, like, assign that out to a student. If you could make that an assignment, create a 12-minute summary of what I did. I don't know. Oh, wait, you're muted. Either um, actually make it an assignment so everybody has to do it uh, once or twice during the semester and give points for it. Oh, we're getting better and better at this brainstorm. <laughs> that is actually one of the ways, um, effective ways of teaching, actually, in terms of having the student uh, teach it back to you. Um, and if they know that they're going to teach it back to you, they're going to actually pay attention. And because <laughs> if you know that you have to teach something, you are definitely going to pay attention a little bit more than just sitting and listening. You'll take more notes because you know you you want to be able to teach well. So that's definitely one of the ways. Um, and I do that too in terms of saying, hey, at the end of the class, uh, if I'm doing a training, I'll be saying at the end of the training or during this training, I'm going to be asking some of you to teach me some of the concepts that you are learning. So pay attention because I'm going to call on you. And so they actually like pay attention a lot more so that they're able to teach it. I love that idea and I'm going to use it sometime this semester. I'm going to make it a really big extra credit thing though. And somebody's, <laughs> and, and, and it's going to be like, they're not going to get to do it Everyone's not going to get to do it. It's just going to be like, if you raise your hand first and you're going to get these extra 20 points for doing it. <laughs> I love how to put a carrot out there, Gloria. <laughs> so, um, 
the classes I have right now are really short, but I'm, I'm going to apply that in my spring class, my technical writing class. I think that will be really helpful to other students. So thank you. Well, you guys, thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. It, it really means so much to me. And, um, and this was a much better session. So this is the one that's actually going to go up on the faculty help desk. Okay. <laughs> so, so thank you all for your participation. It is, it's great. It's great. You're welcome. Thanks for the information. Thank you. Well, yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone.